because I don't want to be between you and lunch. Oh. <laughs> Later. Um, so we're going to, uh, I appreciate you uh, bearing with the, uh, the, the flurry of, of information I just presented on uh, system science um, and on uh, data science, uh, excuse me, and on uh, and different types of methods for pursuing system science. Um, but um, it will be a key part of understanding the coming days and hopefully puts us on the same page with this view of models as learning tools, which will be so important for how we most effectively use the rich sort of high velocity, high variety data afforded to us by, by big data and, and through uh, data science techniques such as machine learning. I wanted to provide a quicker sort of orientation with respect to some elements of data science, um, and particularly to relate it to a set of other buzzwords um, uh, that are, I, they're not just buzzwords, they are very significant, but they are bandied about so often that they've become a bit of buzzwords, and, and I want to provide some reference points in understanding them. Bearing in mind that we're going to see a lot of practical examples to illustrate these features in coming days, okay? including this afternoon going through multiple types of big data. Um, I, this, this presentation partly reflects uh, some requests that have come to me about, uh, with people asking, you know, I hear on the one hand about AI, about machine learning, do data, I hear about data science. What, what are these things? How do they fit together? How do they relate to one another? Are they different synonyms for the same thing? Are they referring to very different things? Um, uh, how, how, do, how do they um, relate to one another? To what degree are they overlapped, etc.? cetera? Um, so data science, as you might expect, uh, first of all, it's a more, uh, more recent uh, term. Um, it's a term that's, uh, uh, that's been around uh, in recent years, uh, which some have argued is a relabeling of a lot of work that was there before, but relabeling in a way that points to its clustering, its clumping with uh, a very commonly uh, pursued together. Um, uh, Michael Jordan, um, my old professor from MIT and uh, Connectionist Methods, has written about this um, in some insightful ways, and I'd refer you to some of his uh, discussions, those who are interested. But data science, uh, one could do worse than uh, say data science consists of mechanisms, processes, principles, and practices, as well as infrastructures and tools supporting methodologies for drawing insight from data. Okay. So it's all about drawing insight from empirical evidence from the world. And it consists of the whole nine yards, the whole pipeline, the whole value chain associated with that. Um, these include infrastructures that we use to process it, but also mechanisms like machine learning, um, machine learning algorithms, for example. Processes like data pipelines that take data in, um, engage in data scrubbing and cleaning, engage in successive data conditioning, engage in fitting that model with different algorithms and testing those algorithms, using cross-validation techniques that, that test the model in an out-of-sample way against data not used to build it and see how well it performs. Um, and it consists of, it also embraces the tools and methodology. So when someone says they do big data, they could be at any number of different places within this curriculum. I could be someone who builds high, highly performant computational architectures for cluster computing with data pipelines. Or I could be someone who engages in the aspects more directly related to machine learning. Um, or I could be someone whose who's focus is in, uh, in, in, in aspects of engineering new languages for describing the data ecosystem most effectively. Data science 
has really come to the fore in large part because of its engagement, in particular focus on big data. And we're going to discuss what that means, but broadly the definition I find least problematic is data associated with the four Vs, sometimes argued to be five Vs. It's big, that's the big and big data, so that's high volume. It's high velocity which is of great significance in this boot camp because our models are all about dynamics over time. And the data that we operate with with big data is often data over time. So we talk about velocity, meaning how quickly it arrives, these observations, how quickly they come in, new observations about the world. Very, of great significance. It's high variety. So a given set of measurements may relate to several different aspects of a person's situation. Where they are, who's nearby them, their level of physical activity or sedentary behavior, how many phone calls they're getting or placing, SMS messages received or not, aspects of browsing behavior, aspects of their ideation as reported by ecological momentary assessments. Variety, all picked up perhaps through ethic on a smartphone. Mm -hmm. So here, um, we have high variety that complements the high velocity, jointly yielding high volume. And finally, it's talked about high veracity, meaning often we're measuring things, sometimes individual measurements, like a GPS location or location based on like how far I am for various Wi-Fi access points clues me into where I am more reliably than if I just self-reported it. Or who I'm with, who I'm nearby. I might not notice the person, a couple, couple people behind me in the Tim Hortons line, but my phone may record that I'm nearby this other participant. So sometimes people add high value and also as a component. So it, it offers a great deal of value um, in many contexts. So big data data subject to these four Vs is the focus of a lot of data science work. And that's why we build new architectures or infrastructures. That's why you build these, these uh, performance algorithms because we don't have the opportunity to use just traditional algorithms because they're too slow to scale to billions of data points that we might have. Um, and data science aspires, importantly, for this boot camp to use data to understand the richness of underlying processes in the world, why we see the data as one of those more distal needs for data science. You don't see talked about that much, but it creeps up in terms of the broader enterprise of data science. We're trying to use data not just to understand one variable, but to understand the world, to understand the processes in the world the data generating processes, the underlying causal processes. And machine learning is a key analysis tool for data science. So a lot of the, the, the mechanisms and, and uh, uh, a lot of the uh, methodologies involved do relate to, to, whoa, to machine learning. Um, uh, so I noted uh, big data, I should have noted in the health space, there's, there's many components. I hit on a couple of them. I won't dwell on these, but um, there are dozens uh, of relevance within the health space, whether one's dealing with uh, uh, health care and the concerns involving that, or whether one's dealing with uh, aspects of, of health behavior more generally. Um, we're increasingly confronted by, by big data sources. And data science provides methods for effectively working with and deriving insight from this big data. And key methods for deriving insight and understanding from big data that are supported by the infrastructure, supported by the data pipelines, these processes and tools like, like uh, cross-validation. Those analysis methods include machine learning methods, which are a subset of artificial intelligence methods that I'll be talking more about in a moment. And I would argue broadly should include system science methods, and which include dynamic modeling, as well as 
other tools such as uh, delay embedding and CCM for, dis for discovering causal linkages between variables. Artificial intelligence, a term that's very widely used these days and quite highly used here in Canada. As we speak, uh, I'm, I'm part of a, one of the PIs on a large grant going into CIHR today being submitted together with colleagues across Canada. Uh, Miguel from, from Calgary, from Manitoba, and uh, from, uh, from uh, a number of other uh, partner organizations, which focuses on AI and public health. And artificial intelligence is broadly construed the use of computational methods to solve problems traditionally requiring national intel uh, natural intelligence. And there's many components of relevance within artificial intelligence for our needs. Many of them subsumed in machine learning, as it turns out, and many that are less relevant. For example, artificial intelligence includes language synthesis, producing words, for example, language understanding, natural language processing which has some relevance when you come to understand tweets, for example, or when you come to understand aspects of social behavior online, um, uh, but is, is a little bit um, more distant for our needs. It includes components involving robotics and path planning, for example, to get from A to B, um, uh, for human language communication and, and interaction with the environment, um, developing theory. Some parts of this are uh, more close to our interests in, in, in data science in this, um, uh, in this event. Uh, some, like robotics, less so. Um, there's a bit of jaundice when it comes to, um, to artificial intelligence. Um, I'm old enough to have lived through multiple years of feast and famine when it comes to artificial artificial intelligence. When I was in bachelor's years at MIT as an undergrad, um, MIT was the hub of a, of a blossoming AI revolution based in, particularly in Kendall Square area, right next to the MIT campus, AI Alley as it was called at the time. Um, and there was, uh, there was a tremendous amount of venture capital being placed into AI. That led to the AI winter some years later. Um, in the 1990s, there was a perennial surge in AI interest around, uh, around neural network methods, particularly. Uh, and I was fortunate to learn from Michael Jordan, who was one of the pioneers of these methods, uh, in a course that was joint MIT undergraduate graduate years. But that, that too, um, saw its place, um, uh, but, it, but it, ended up uh, not, not reaching all the potential people were anticipating in terms of revolutionizing artificial <laughs> intelligence. We're now in, a, um, in another crest, and I missed a crest in the late 60s and early 70s, where I wasn't yet uh, delivering these boot camps. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, students, I know, I know you think I was born when the earth was still cooling. <laughs> you know, um, the sun was in its earliest years, but uh, not quite that old. Um, uh, so, so you know, there's been boom and bust with AI over the years. Uh, tremendous amount of hype, tremendous amount of, of of money, tremendous amount of burn rate through companies, and then uh, in some cases, um, overshoot and collapse. Um, uh, one thing that is true uh, is that. And each of these peaks, each of these revolutions, as it's been heralded, that later disappointed many expectations, a lot was done, a lot was contributed, a lot of success was achieved. A lot of what came out of the neural network, for example, uh, flourishing in the late, in the early 1990s, ended up going into prosaic algorithms. It, it didn't lead to systems that would immediately understand human language in all its richness, or to robots that, that behave indistinguishable from people and pass the Turing test. But instead, it led to better recognition of handwriting, or it led to enhanced understanding 
of uh, limited vocabulary languages when you're on the phone. Uh, or it led to uh, enhanced detection of credit card fraud. Um, so it's not that there weren't advances. There were. There were big advances. It's just that there was a lot of hype in the popular press that overstated itself and that, uh, that talked about it in too grandiose a way that soon our robotic masters might come culling for us and you know, be indistinguishable, the androids amongst us. Um, uh, and, and that didn't come about, but a lot of very useful things did. And each time AI went through these crests, it found its place in a growing number of different uses, often more prosaic, more day-to-day, -day, less flashy than anticipated, but useful nonetheless, and, and significant nonetheless. Um, uh, Tesler's theorem um, uh, commented wryly that Whatever cognitive task hasn't been automated yet is termed AI. Um, uh, so that's, that's the frontier of AI. It's just automating what hasn't been done yet, and it changes, therefore, over time. And you sometimes hear big AI and small AI talked about, where big AI has you know, a millennialist vision of entirely automating human thinking, and small AI is all about these pragmatic small, uh, small steps. Um, machine learning is one subset of artif artificial intelligence, or machine intelligence. Um, and it involves a number of different sub-areas, which include inferencing. For example, this is sometimes confusingly called prediction. And you have to be very careful about this, because in the AI context, often inference is used the word prediction, whereas as a dynamic model, I think of prediction in the future. This is like filling in the gaps, filling in missing data, data imputation, or, or imputing some underlying circumstance without necessarily projecting forward. So you hear predictive analytics. Just be aware that that means different things to different people. Into a dynamic model, or what I would like it to mean, might be nowhere near what someone else needs it to mean. Um, uh, and there's a variety of techniques even in that area. Bayesian networks, artificial neural networks, deep learning be included as an extension there. There's classification. Um, uh, you know, classification of a given case. Is it this type of case or that sort of case? How is it likely to be resolved in the future? Or, or uh, what sort of cases is this? Is this likely to be someone who has a mental health issue or not, subject to depression or not, et cetera? Um, uh, inferring situation over time and then projecting forward. And as we'll see, hidden Markov models are a, a very well established area there. And they meet um, a more rich, uh, continuous understanding in the form of particle filtering, particle and CMC, Coleman filtering, for example. Um, pattern recognition, um, recognizing faces, recognizing dogs, recognizing pandas. Um, so I, I, <laughs> I told my students one time, because of um, a family history, um, uh, one time I was searching for uh, pandas online. Um, and uh, Google returned to me a bunch of photos of pandas. This is a Google image search. It also returned to me a bunch of photos of Holstein cows that <laughs> were black and white <laughs> with big spots. <laughs> Not quite. Um, I think it's now much better. Um, but sometimes it includes, you know, panda dressed individuals, you know, um, who are who are dressed like a panda, but are not a real one. Um, uh, and and so pattern recognition, recognizing patterns and images that are characteristic of something, uh, is one of the big areas that that machine learning has contributed. You know, I can go to Google Photos and I can search for all photos of myself in these in these images, and it will recognize me even when it's a partial face. I, I know because I've seen it. You know, part of my face that's in there, me from the side, me from the front. Pattern recognition is a is a, a very well established that goes uh, area that goes back decades. On um, finding hidden structure, you know, identifying clusters or hidden hidden. Uh, patterns or structure within the data. Um, 
uh, and, and processing data in a way that brings out those structures, identifies salient um, patterns or curves or relationships or manifolds among different variables. So machine learning um, involves many different uh, sub-areas. Um, and different machine learning approaches are used for different uh, needs. Um, uh, this needs by, these needs vary by the goal of the analysis. Are you trying to classify instances? Are you trying to project forward? Are you trying to find hidden patterns that, that aren't obvious but explain variation in a crisp way? Take a huge amount of different features and boil them down to just a few salient differences that apply across many features? Um, are you trying to infer a true situation under the covers? When is this person smoking? When is this person engaged in um, carrying the phone as opposed to oh, and being stationary? Um, when did the person fall? When did the phone fall? Um, uh, so, so um, identifying an underlying true situation is a need in a lot of our models. And um, this can be used to detect, say, when someone has a cough or someone's, uh, um, someone's engaged in a certain health behavior. Maybe they're going running or, or they're engaged in physical activity. Um, uh, are we considering change over time? A lot of AI models are, sta a lot of machine learning models are static. Um, they don't consider change over time. Many others are, are depicting things over time. They're dynamic in the sense that they depict change over time, different data points at different points of time, such as with inferring the true underlying situation over time. Are we trying to predict something for the current situation or following an intervention? Um, uh, you know, we'll use uh, different approaches. Um, because following an intervention might change certain certain patterns. The type of data being considered is it categorical, continuous? Um, that we're considering. Are we trying to categorize two nominal categories, a dichotomous classification? Are we trying to identify a, a pattern that's uh, about a continuous underlying random variable that varies in some regular way with other variables? Is there theory to inform a model? Do we want to bring that theory to bear, such as in uh, Bayesian, Bayesian networks? Um, is this an unsupervised approach or a supervised approach? Where a supervised approach, we know the true situation for a subset of classes, and we can train a model so that it reliably, reliably can classify the true situation for a library of examples that are firmly classified. And then we can use it for things where we haven't, after we validate it with those for, for whom we know the situation, but we didn't use in building the model, we can then test it on other examples, or we can use it on other examples. Versus unsupervised, we don't have uh, the luxury of knowing the true situation. Maybe it's such voluminous data, it would be hopeless to, to uh, try. And we want to find unsupervised ways of identifying kind of the best model. And we'll see some examples uh, of that. A common approach within machine learning that applies in dynamic modeling as well is what's called cross-validation. So here, we train a model, or for dynamic modeling, build the model, calibrate the model, parameterize the model, based on some subset of the data. And then we evaluate the model in the other subset of data. This is sometimes called out-of-sample validation. So we we're using a subset of data um, to, to tra train it, but there's another set set aside in escrow, as it, well, as it were, that's set aside once we've built the model to then test it. And sometimes there's several levels of that. There's testing and validation that's separated. Um, and this approach is commonly repeated in what's called n-fold cross-validation on different subsets of data. But this is complicated in certain cases, like where we're dealing with temporal data where you can't just pick su different subsets willy-nilly. You can only divide it at certain places for contiguous sequences. Um, okay, so machine learning, these types of uh, needs will accompany us through the boot camp. And these sorts of methods, uh, cross-validation methods, and um, 
these sorts of, of sort of indicators to inform our choice of method will accompany us as well. And to this end, I have shared with you a set of slides on model sel or methodology selection, which provides a rubric for deciding if you want to apply some of the methods that I'm presenting here, which method might you apply under which circumstance based on some of these considerations? Um, are you dealing with continuous data or, um, or, or categorical data? Are you trying to understand things over time or trying to infer, trying to imp impute, etc.? cetera? Um, so uh, you might want to look at those. Those are in the, 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 the Google Drive. Um, uh, and I would further note that um, we'll see some examples later today of classification. We'll do a, a lot of uh, application of particle filtering, particle MCMC, inferring the underlying situation over time and projecting. Um, we might talk about pattern recognition. We've done a lot of that, such as recognizing coughs or recognizing um, a crying behavior of a baby or recognizing a snoring, uh, for example. Um, uh, and finding hidden structure will be um, uh, something you may, uh, may see. We'll certainly may talk about convergent cross-mapping. Um, and uh, inference uh, might figure uh, as well. Okay, so uh, those are some uh, comments here on data science, uh, machine learning, its relationship to big data, and some, some sort of orientation with respect to these. I'm going to dive into some of this right now, particularly on the big data front, but want to ask, are there any questions people would want to ask right now before I dive into a little bit more detail on health big data? Question? Okay. Okay, so I will switch over. Um, I've been recording each of these sessions, and uh, forgive me if 